Welcome to the Recruiting Stories Podcast, where we celebrate recruiting by exploring the stories of leaders and top performers by digging into their stories and understanding how recruiting has impacted their journey and their success. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Recruiting Stories Podcast. Before we get going, we've got some housekeeping stuff. This is the last episode uh, of season one. It's been amazing to see all the amazing guests that we've had. Um, super thankful for everybody who's listened. Moving forward, we're going to make a few changes to the podcast. So um, what you've been hearing is someone being interviewed somewhere between like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. That's going to stay the same. So that'll come out probably once a month moving forward. Uh, hopefully every two weeks in between that, you'll also hear something come out called the two minute drill. Two minute drill is going to be primarily focused on uh, improving your recruiting process. So that might just be me giving you some quick tidbits, some advice on how to improve your recruiting process, how to get recruited if you're a candidate, how to handle certain situations within the recruiting process. Um, And uh, hopefully it'll be really helpful. We might also have some guests in there um, who um, will help us navigate some of the challenges that happen within recruiting, specifically in the transportation world as well. Uh, so I think you're going to like that. That'll be more content both on uh, YouTube and then on, on the podcast there as well. So be looking out for that going into 2022. Thank you guys so much for listening. This week, our guest is Anthony Petit. He is the founder and CEO of Truck Park. Um, if you haven't heard of it yet, uh, it's a solution that Um, helps truckers find places to park um, you know when they have you know their uh, their end of hours that they've got to uh, to to get parked and get get off the road Um, it helps them find some place quickly kind of an airbnb for truck parking super cool concept a solution that will save them uh, time um, keep them safer um, and, uh, and just make their lives a lot easier as well as a lot of companies um, and organizations as well, which will translate to, uh, uh, to happier uh, brokers and uh, shippers and truck trucking companies and all of the above uh, if we can keep truckers happy. So um, definitely listen to this. The thing I like about Anthony, one, we have a ton of things in common. Two, he was uh, formerly um, in the recruiting uh, world uh, as well. So hearing his, I guess, you know, insight, I think is super cool to sit back and listen to someone who's been uh, in corporate recruiting and been in, um, you know, executive recruiting as well. Uh, it's really interesting to hear his thoughts on, um, you know, what that looks like, you know, now that he's focused on being a, a transportation technology founder uh, as well. So has some great thoughts on just culture and uh, how to take care of um, uh, the trucking industry and truckers within that as well as um, uh, just employees and, and folks in the industry. So hope you enjoy it. If you've got questions, feel free to reach out to me afterwards. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can always email me as well. I look forward to your feedback and uh, thanks again for listening. All right, guys, welcome to another uh, episode of the Recruiting Stories podcast. I'm super excited. Uh, we have Anthony Pettit, uh, the CEO and founder of Truck Park. Did I say your name right, Anthony? You did. I mean, it's Anthony Petit. It's like, think about cool. small, leaving on 6'3". Six, six, <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much for being on. Uh, excited to have you, you know, especially uh, in the environment we're in right now, which I think like 10 years ago, like nobody really cared about supply chain and logistics, but in, in the current environment, I mean, it's all over the news. We talk about supply chain disruptions. Um, we talk about shortages. Um, and so it's, it's uh, you know, as important as ever. And obviously we both function in that space and serve uh, people in that space. So for those who aren't familiar, would you mind telling us just about Truck Park, um, what it is and, and maybe, you know, how you founded, um, you know, the company, the app? Sure. Well, look, you know, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. I, I, I do appreciate it. It always gives you know, Truck Park as well as myself just uh, more visibility in the market, um, which is actually really how Truck Park all started is about that, that visibility, making sure that we can connect the supply and the demand together, create a create a marketplace where the drivers can find the parking locations and the parking locations can be visible to the drivers. So, um yeah, so really, this business began with my late uncle. Um, at the time, I, w- I was actually in, 
working for a, um, a last mile company in the recruiting space um, as a corporate recruiter. So those who, who don't know what a corporate recruiter is, it is the actual person who sits, like not the HR generalist, but the other person in the company who actually recruits uh, candidates internally in the company. So I was doing that, uh, which almost seems like many moons ago at this point. <laughs> um, but even with that said, my uncle was a truck driver. He was a truck driver for about 25 to 30 years of his life. He was short haul. He was doing team surge, so a lot of union uh, work. And then he actually owned a parking facility in the south side of Chicago, and I'm from Chicago. And uh, I actually helped him, or he asked me for my help. So then I helped him to to show the visibility of his, of his location to drivers. And we had tons of calls come in. And the number one thing was, where the heck is your location? I'm driving yeah, around. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost at the hour, uh, end of my hours of service. I got to park. And we would say, okay, well, you have to follow the path, this path, this path. At that point, I was like, forget it. We need to create something where we can show visibility. We can show yeah. your location to not just the drivers who drive past your location late at night. We can show this to drivers that are way up in, you know, maybe Madison, Wisconsin, that are going to do one last drop off in Chicago downtown. And then now we got to go find a place to park. So that's how truck park really started. And then I kind of started seeing the vision. Okay. We can't just do it with one parking location. What's the point of that? We have all this visibility, but we have one location. So why don't we expand? So I actually took the, the idea was at that point was really just truck parking facility. And I turned it into truck park and I said, I can build this up into an application and the application can go, across all the country, all of North America. That was my vision back in um, 2017 when we first started. And uh, till this day, we actually have just over a thousand locations now. They're That's not amazing. owned by Truck Park. They're not our assets. They're independently owned and operated facilities by other operators that we've given the ability, just like uh, an Airbnb for people mm -hmm. of, of all sorts of different sizes and shapes of truck parking facilities to host and show the visibility of their brand on, the locate, on our, our platform. And then vice versa with the truckers that say, hey, like, I just need parking. Well, now we have a thousand locations, hopefully parking all over the place wherever the driver is at the final hour searching for their, for their place to park. It's it's awesome solution. I, I love the idea and I, I just think it's amazing, um, you know, um, solution that you've built because you're, you're solving problems for a lot for a lot of people. Tell me about just, you know, what what did that look like? you know, I guess before something like truck park, where, where, are tr where do truckers end up parking for, for those who are listening, who may not be as familiar um, within the industry? Like, you know, what, I mean, they're just on the side of the road. Are they in, uh, you know, Walmart parking lots? Like where, where do they end up? Yeah, so I would say pre truck park, yeah, they were in Walmart parking lots. Walmart used to have a service where they could drive up to the location and park, but it was just becoming too confusing with, the trucks mixed in with the cars and there's accidents. So they actually stopped that. Um, but the other thing was, yeah, you, you go down the, the major highways or the freight corridors and you would see all the trucks literally lined up, not in the truck stops, but on the ramps, the truck stops, at the end of the truck stop and then exiting out back from the highway. So we were trying to figure out a way where we can also take a lot of that overflow and bring it into our location and say, hey, look, you're not going to be safe at a ramp. Like there is right. the trucks coming especially at night, there's trucks coming, there's cars coming, they're all trying to exit and, and core off from the highway. They're going fast, flying off the exit. You don't have cones set up, which, you know, I can't blame the driver. You're supposed to do it, right? right. You've learned this in driving school, but you can't blame a driver who's exhausted at night. All they right. want to do is park and get back in the back of their, their tractors and sleep. So yeah. at the end of the day, you know, we wanted to come out with a solution that's going to mitigate all of those risk variables and bring them into a place where they can actually find safe haven. That's awesome. So for someone who's interested in using Truck Park, um, I guess just off the back there, like who who, who do you want to target and how do they uh, how do they get started? Uh, just briefly. Yeah, I mean, it's super simple. We actually created Truck Park with the driver in mind. So before we even built up the application, we sat down with, and I say in every podcast, I'm just being, 500,000 trucks, like literally. We not only sat down with them and had one-on-one -on -one focus group conversations to understand how the app should be built, 
but we also went as far as going to a truck stop and knocking on driver doors and saying, hey, yeah. like, what would the, an ideal app look like in a parking space? So all of that driver data, all of that driver knowledge, it was just replicated in our application. And that's where drivers could easily download our application. It takes like literally two minutes or less to create a profile. And then doing what they need most is creating more efficiencies in the route planning by booking a reservation ahead of time or booking reservation on demand, literally right before they need a park. Uh, and if you guys haven't been on it, um, it's it's a super easy to use uh, app. The interface is is fantastic. Um, just just really great ease of use. Um, design looks great. I encourage you to all to, to download it and take a look at it and recommend it to people uh, who may not know about it uh, in your circle. Um, most people listening to this are in the transportation industry, so uh, it's a it's a great deal. Um, I, I'm also excited to have Anthony on here because he's from a recruiting background. So for for me, I always get a little bit giddy about that because uh, we can commiserate a little bit, and maybe you know, share some pain <laughs> having someone who's been been through uh, some similar things. So. If you don't mind, I want to talk just a little bit about your recruiting story, uh, Anthony, and, and how, you know, you ended up uh, in the world that you're in now and, and kind of what led you there. So you told me you're you know from Chicago. I think I saw that you went to, to Bowling Green for college. Walk me through maybe some of, you know, your backstory and then what, uh, you know, either people or places kind of led you to where you are today. Yeah, I mean, uh, just so much led me to, to be a recruiter. Um, you know, really starting off with in college, graduating from college with a hospitality uh, and uh, business degree. So that, you know, part of hospitality is is making sure that you're meeting customer experience, you're meeting customer satisfaction, and you're also speaking with so many people. So when you're speaking with people, usually you're selling them something or you're trying to get them to come to whatever space that you're promoting. And so, for example, if you're working as a corporate recruiter at a company, uh, let's say like a, a PepsiCo, you're trying to bring in outside candidates, potentially from a Coca-Cola or another competitor in the beverage space, and you're trying to bring them into PepsiCo, but then you're also giving them the customer customer satisfaction, the like the the tools that they need to come in and be the best they can be in that environment. And um, that's really what I like really enjoy is is that that um that human interaction space mm -hmm. and in a way i guess besides just having a, a degree in hospitality but it, it always was something that i enjoyed like i i grew up in chicago as you stated grew up in the north shore part of chicago so actually grew up in a, in a small town called Will Met. um for those who don't know you actually do know if you've seen Home Alone. So they, they filmed okay, Home cool. Alone literally like when he's running and he was like hiding in the in the nativity set, that big tunnel church is actually literally in, in my hometown of Bull Metal. I just watched that this week. So that's exciting. Okay. Good to so know. So you gotta go back to the scene <laughs> where he's literally like he's hiding in the nativity set or mm -hmm. he's literally at the at the church and in the from you know, in the beginning of the story, he, he's really nervous about the neighbor with, mm -hmm. the, you know, the hands all wrapped in bandage, but then they become friends and, and what, whatever. But yeah. that, that scene literally takes place in my hometown. So that's cool. Even with that, even with that said, um, I went to a school named uh, Nutra High School. So we actually, the, the difference between my school was like, it was almost a small college. Like we had 5,000 students from freshman oh. to senior. And so that was another opportunity for me to become uh, like a big uh, connector or people mm -hmm. talker, if you will. Like that's really not even a word, but I just enjoy talking to people because I, I just, I was in the environment, right? Like there was maybe about 35 to 40 people in each of my classes. I graduated with 1200 students before I even went to college. So it was always, there was always something there for me that wanted to interact with people. And so when I when I got out of college, I was I was looking at jobs. I actually my first job ever was with my cousin. He owned a company of about 180 employees at the time, and and I was doing actually marketing. I was marketing. I was I was managing uh, search engine optimization. And about a couple of years into it, I kind of just thought to myself. I said, I really don't want to do this. This is not something I want to do. I can't be behind the desk all day. I want to I want to be customer interacting, I want to be consumer interacting, I want to be in front of people having conversations. So um, I actually applied 
for in, in the same company for my cousin's company i applied for a corporate group position <clears throat> and not because it's my cousin but i went actually through his business partner who gave me a fair interview process with all these other candidates and i was hired in the company as uh corporate recruiter number two and uh with corporate recruiter number two he uh had me try to get all these different candidates from marketing to uh, developers to sales etc and then um from there I, I had about a year's worth of experience, and then I moved into another company where it was completely different for me. It was executive search placement. I was doing executive okay. searches internationally in countries mm-hmm. like in London, England. I was in Brussels, Belgium. We were in Hong Kong, China. We were doing all these searches for big, big roles. It was no longer you know, bringing in a, a DevOps person, and now it was bringing in C-level candidates. From the mm-hmm. So there was a lot to learn, but the recruiting industry, and, and I'll just take a rest here, the recruiting industry is a tough industry, um, especially in the world today with everything that's going on. And we could talk a little bit more about that. I don't want to sure. steal the show about talking so much about my background, but I wanted to give the viewers just a little understanding of, you know, where I started and mm-hmm. in the middle before I even came over to Tuck Park before I even become a founder or CEO of a company, I was actually face to face with a lot of individuals. Well, and, and I think that's so important, right? Because just understanding, um, you know, where I mean, that's what we explore. I mean, so what this show is about is exploring how leaders and top performers got to where they are. And uh, because really what's so interesting to, to me is uh, most highly successful people, right? Um, they all started or uh, had a stage just like everybody else. And so everybody else, whether they're, you're an entry level role, uh, whether you're a manager, whether you're unemployed, like at some point, so was someone who's been successful. So it's to me, I love to explore a little bit uh, of that and just kind of see, hey, so so was somebody else. But what were the steps that took them from, you know, where you might be today to where uh, that that person is now? So t- talk to me about that. So you um, you had um, obviously this great experience recruiting. Um, you had a chance to see some different industries. Um, and then um, you, you had an idea for Truck Park, or maybe your uncle had uh, maybe an idea for Truck Park. So talk to me about that transition from saying, hey, I'm recruiting for people literally around the world to we've got this idea to start a business. What is that like for someone who's maybe, you know, hey, I'm considering going out on my own or, you know, um, you know, stepping into something new. What would that process like for you? Well, <laughs> it's definitely a roller coaster process. You know, nobody you know, become successful overnight. And for people to tell you that, oh yeah, you can um, get successful overnight, it's a get rich quick scheme and don't do it. It's it's, <laughs> it's actually worth it's actually worth going through the really difficult times to get to, you know, the, the good times, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's just, it, there was so much transition in my life. I, I don't know if that's the same for everybody. I've done just so many things and I'm, I'm so grateful and so blessed to have done those things. Like you've said, like I, I was in different industries. I was recruiting in industrial. I was recruiting in manufacturing. I was recruiting in, in, in finance and I was recruiting. Uh, at one point I was recruiting, you know, marketing and engineers, but then at another point I was recruiting CEOs. So mm-hmm. I, I've had a lot of experience in that. But for somebody who's just starting and, and maybe they're starting in the recruiting space and they don't know what to do, like they, they don't know if they want to be a corporate recruiter, which again is internal. They don't want to be an external recruiter, like a talent acquisition. They, you know, they don't know what company they want to join. The best advice I can give is to, to really do a lot of research. You want to make sure that it's good for you as much as it, it's good for the company hiring you. And, you know, you're going to be, that candidate, so to speak, when you're going out to look for a job. Now, if you have a job, then, and you are looking to do better in recruiting, um, the best advice that I can give is that recruiting is, is just as hard as any other industry. It's not, it, it takes a while. There's so many, there's such a, a elongated life cycle, especially in higher positions. You're not going to be closing down a C level position in two months. It's just not going to happen. I was closing down C level positions in one year. So you just have to kind of wait. You have to have patience, but also you have to have true grit, right? Like there is a lot in this business. A candidate's going to call you at eight o'clock at night. You're going to be eating dinner with your family, or you're resting on the couch. And they're going to be like, hey, like you have some time to talk. Like I, I want to talk about me. And you're like, really? Um, let's talk about you tomorrow. And you're like, no, I really want to talk about me. And, you know, 
you can, what I fail to do, actually, this might be a, a good segue. Mm -hmm. I, I used to ignore the calls. And then mm -hmm. the next day, in, in the next day, the, the candidate called me and like, um, what, what happened? I'm like, oh, yeah, I, whatever. I made up something. And the candidate would be like, well, I thought you were going to help me find a position. And then mm -hmm. what happened later, actually, with that particular candidate is that they went to another company and they got filled. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. talking about like, a lot of money, right? For big right. C level candidates. So yep. I've learned in my lesson, you gotta stay the course. You have to be yep. patient and you have to to really work hard and whatever hours of the day, give your give your focus, give your your um your thoughtfulness, that kindness to that person because you don't know what situation they're in. They're trying to find a job just like you're trying to find a job or they're trying to find a position just like you're trying to fulfill a position. So um, anyways, I've gone, I've gone into a lot of different, that's okay. Uh, yeah. I definitely wanted to kind of give that, that story. No, that's, that's perfect. I, you know, and I, I, I like, if, if you're watching the video, you can see me like chuckling a little bit here and I'm only laughing because I can relate so much to what <laughs> Anthony's saying on the recruiting side, uh, because there's, uh, there's certainly there are painful moments, uh, when it, when it comes to recruiting, but let's talk a little bit about that just because of your experience, obviously. <clears throat> and I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, truck park as we go, but, you know, coming from, recruiting world i guess one question i have is why do you think when you look at uh, the recruiting and transportation industry as a whole um, i'm just kind of curious on your thoughts uh, here like why do you think the recruiting or i guess the uh, transportation industry as a whole why do you think it has a turnover problem i guess the follow up to that would be like what do you think we what do you think we need to do about it as an industry like as a as a whole so that, that answer comes in many parts in, in my opinion at least um, the recruiting, I think, is I think it's good, right? Like the, the industry is recruiting well. The recruiting drivers are getting the right drivers. I think there needs to be maybe some more diversification within the driver communities. Um, you know, I'm not saying that we need to go out and, and freak out and get like high school drivers because there could mm -hmm. be an issue there as well with the maturity and then just like the, the driver skill. Um, but what I'm I guess what I'm saying is that there is much more than just recruiting in that, in that answer. Um, yeah. But recruiting does play a, a big part in it because recruiting also plays with retention, right? right. Because just right. because you can recruit somebody to a company doesn't mean that person is going to be sustainable. Right. So one of the biggest things that you just said, the key word is turnover. Why are these right. companies having this massive turnover? Why are drivers leaving the industry? Why don't they want to drive anymore? Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was it was like every boy's dream to become a truck driver. I used yeah. to be a truck driver. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And it was awesome. It was like tour the road, be be a truck driver, get in there, be gritty, you know, uh, get your shoes dirty. And mm -hmm. it was like one of those things that was such a, a great thing to be. And everybody's like, hmm, I don't know if I want to be a driver anymore. And yeah. I think part of that is just be, it's just industry's fault too. Like mm -hmm. this is a big industry, a billion dollar industry. And we're looking around like, do we have enough money and capital to hire this person? Do we have enough cap capital to pay them? Well, why should we pay them a sign on bonus of, of thirty four hundred? Don't right. you think that's a, a little expensive? I don't think so at all. I mean, I, yeah. I, to be honest, maybe they don't even need sign bonuses. Maybe you just need to care for that driver a little bit more. Right. To do with recruiting too, it's when you recruit somebody, you're not just recruiting them so they can be another driver and they can make totally. your business money. You're recruiting them is because you're bringing another human being into the community and you want to build up that human being, right? That human being sure. is not going to stay with you if they don't feel like they are a part of something. They don't feel like they're involved in something, right? Yeah. And just a just a little uh, short story I just want to bring up, and I'll be super concise with it. But the the best way to ever keep somebody is making them feel part of something. Mm -hmm. And the story behind that is, my wife actually was telling me the other day that she, well, my wife used to be a Division One uh, basketball coach for uh, for uh, University of Nevada, actually, mm -hmm. and uh, she was a basketball coach's assistant, but the way that they were able to get sponsors is that my wife went out and she created these, these like literally these shirts that were golf shirts and you're in a basketball industry. So most industries like football, basketball, hockey, golf, they only want to be in their industry. Like we're just going to go after the, the basketball shirts, but the basketball shirts were these really high cotton. They were really hot. She was at university of Nevada. So you can imagine the weather was really mm -hmm. hot. 
Um, and my wife went out and she she found the, this clothing that was like really breathable and they were golf gear. And people were like, yeah. how would you have golf gear? You know, but they were like golf gear for, for women's like attire. Anyways, the, the moral of the story here is that the people that were buying were, were booster people. They were like putting mm-hmm. their money down so they can invest in the program. So they bought these shirts and they were putting these shirts on and they were like, these are the best shirts I've ever felt in my life. They're breathable. They're right. Mm-hmm. They're great. I mean, they look mm-hmm. great. You know what I mean? And, and people were, were literally like, they were walking the streets and other people were like, how can I get there? <laughs> like, right. Well, you can buy it here and then you can, you know, be a part of something. You can be part yep. of like this investing because just buying a shirt is investing in as a booster. Yep. And so anyways, the part of that is that they felt that they were a part of something because they had like this really nice luxurious shirt on and they all of a sudden added on more people and more people were staying as well. Like mm-hmm. people used to be boosters and like, yeah, I'll just go to another, another university and booster there. It was like, no, I actually feel like I'm involved now. Like I'm actually going out. I'm like really promoting this, so to speak, with other people in the streets and people want to want to buy it. So I think, again, that has nothing to do with the, the trucking industry, but it has to do a lot with retaining people. Mm. And you want to make somebody feel like they're involved. If a trucker feels like they are going to be involved in that company, then you're going to want to make sure that trucker is cared for. You want to make sure whatever situation there may be, that trucker is not just another number out there. You want to make sure that you have conversations with that driver. Yep. You know, one of the things we do at Truck Truck Park is we actually reach out to the driver and say, well, you parked in that location, great. But how was your experience? Some people will be like, right. not so great. Okay, well, why is it so great? Well, right. you know, they shut the lights off at you know, one o'clock in the morning and then I couldn't really get my truck out of there. Hmm. Okay. Right. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, uh, miss, can you please leave your lights out until four o'clock in the morning? The driver's trying to get out at one o'clock. Absolutely. Well, driver calls me back. You know what? I, uh, I parked there again just the other night and uh, the lights were actually up at one o'clock and I was able to get out. Hmm. Fine. Did you have something to do with that? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, so you're trying to make your, your experience a lot better. Hmm. You know what? I'm going to tell all my friends about this app. I love yep. it. Boom. So it's like yep. you want to you, you want to have somebody retain. You want to keep a loyal customer. But forget the loyal customer. They're, just, they're going to tell the world if that experience is great. I think that's how we keep this industry. So, again, I'm, I'm going into this really long, elongated process. But I want the viewers to really understand if you treat people respectfully, if you treat the drivers, the people – that are literally hauling day in and day out, putting products in front of you. Like I'm sitting at a desk right now. And this desk, there, by the size of it, there's no way that a truck driver couldn't deliver. Like the truck driver had to deliver the product. There's no mm-hmm. way that I could have just walked out of the store like this. Right. So sure. What I'm saying is we need to, as consumers, we need to, as trucking owners, we need to, as as uh, dispatchers, we need to focus and pay attention to our most valuable assets is the driver. The minute we do that, I guarantee you this industry is going to start retaining more drivers. And back to what I was saying, the drivers will go say, hey, this industry is awesome again. I'm going to go mm-hmm. tell my, my friend about it. I'm going to go tell my brother about it. I'm going to go tell my son about it. I would love right. for my son to be part of this because yeah. now I feel like I'm welcome. I, I love that. I, I mean, you hit on so many things that I think are um, wonderful. I think w- one thing that re- relates well to me being a former athlete is I, it's, it's something that I do think that the transportation industry could learn from like athletics, right? Colleges and athletics, like, uh, and, and just sports teams in general, they do a great job when it comes to like branding, but the branding is like, it's amazing how people feel like they're a part of something, you know, you get, you can wear the jersey, you can wear uh, the shirt or what have you. And not only that, especially colleges, right? Like you are contributing to a higher cause. You know, like if I can wear that University of Nevada um, shirt, it's not not only am I am I doing not only am I like rooting for this basketball team, but I'm supporting a cause that is you know helping people get a higher education, an institution for higher learning, uh, and that's meaningful, right? And, and if we can create um, organizations that have meaningful missions and then invite people into those meaningful missions. Well, suddenly like I'm not just hauling freight for X dollars per hour, you know, like I am like 
helping kids have a great Christmas, right? You're helping uh, people eat during a pandemic, right? You're finding ways where it's just like, hey, man, this is this is important. And I think that when you can speak to that mission, that greater purpose behind those things, whether it's a, a, a brokerage, whether it's a transportation technology company, whether you know uh, they're drivers and a trucking company, whatever piece of this industry, there's just so many pieces where I think suddenly people are like, yeah, I want to stick around. And obviously we need to pay people well. And, you know, there's a lot of things to, but that mission, I think, um, speaks to, uh, to a lot of things. And, and what you said earlier is you're treating people like people, All right? We're treating people like human beings and not just, uh, the another, another number, uh, on a, on a spreadsheet. And I think that's just, that's just crucial. That's awesome. I love that. That's good. What do you think, um, you know, for, I guess, you know, companies that are out there, having been someone who recruits uh, in the past um, and maybe someone, um, you know, who might be considering something different now, like process has changed over the years, you know, what do you think people could do today, um, both as an organization and then as an individual to, you know, put themselves in the best position to win when it comes to finding like the best opportunity and the, the best talent, I guess. I think, uh, again, there's, there's so many answers into that question. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I have to say mine, but, you know, I, there's just there's so much talent, first of all, in this industry, right? There's so much talent, and there's so many positions available. And I think a good recruiter, whether you're starting off or you're just an experienced recruiter, you really want to look at it, like, literally the overall, right? Like, you want to look at all the positions that are available. You want to look at the company that you might be internally recruiting for. You want to be looking at, um, if you're an executive search firm in, in, in trucking, you want to be looking at, you know, what are the positions that need to be filled at that company or the company that hired me to, to fill those positions. And you just, I, I, I truly believe that you really, besides just, okay, finding good talent, you want to go out and talk to that talent. Mm-hmm. You want to have a, a relationship with that talent, you know, that's, that's probably the most important thing I can say is relationship, honestly, because yep. uh, it's the biggest thing in just in general recruiting, even if you're not in trucking, if you're in, uh, you know, data science or you're in finance, okay. Like building a relationship with that individual is key. Because mm-hmm. as soon as you know that person, then you're not going to only be able to recruit for your specific role, but you can help that person out, which also comes back 360. I've helped out people in the past that I brought into Fortune 500 companies. They'll call me two or three years later and say, hey, I, I really appreciate for what you did. I left the company, went to another company, but let me tell you something. I had the best time when I was in that company mm-hmm. and you, you did it for me. And this is what I'm going to do for you. If you ever need anything, you let me know. I got you. And that's it. And you created, you just created a whole other, because you built up a relationship now you created up some sort of, you know, um, connection with that person. In the, in the future, you might be looking for a job. That person will reach out to you and say, hey, you need a job. I remember when you helped me out. Now let me help you out. Mm-hmm. And I think that could be my best advice for people is to build relationships. I think that relationships are huge. I mean, it's 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 not just about, you know, putting a butt in a seat. It's 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 it's, it's like you said, that relationship is is like we said earlier. It's almost like, hey, I'm bringing somebody into my family, um, whether I'm corporate recruiter bringing somebody into a company that I work for. You, you want a good family member. You want somebody who you can trust and you can, you know, uh, you know, they're going to pull their weight. Um, you know, and if you're uh, even if you're you know external from that, like you're building trust with your clients um, on both ends. Right. And so you, you want to make sure that um, transparency is key and trust uh, is, is a big part of all of that. So I love that. Um, you started talking about drivers earlier. I wanted to ask this because I know this is a, kind of a popular topic, you know, while while we're on here uh, as well as, you know, there's like this idea of like a driver shortage right now. Do you have any insight on that? Like, do you feel that with truck park, um, you know, the idea of, of just a driver shortage or, um, I mean, do you have any insights or thoughts just from your perspective? I, I honestly believe that the driver shortage is, is existent and non-existent at the same time because, mm-hmm. You know, I personally don't feel the driver shortage. However, I know companies are like actual yeah. asset-based trucking, trucking companies. 
Um, but if they're, again, if you're feeling the driver shortage, it's most likely because something is not working out. Um, the drivers are not interested in your company. They're not interested in sustaining themselves in your company. Maybe you're not treating the driver with the most respect. Maybe you see that driver is the, the, another number on the spreadsheet. Maybe you see uh, the driver that, oh, as long as they get work done, you know, my financial bottom line is protected. Um, or you see that the driver's leaving because, you know, there's really not much retention in your company. There's nothing keeping that driver there. So I think there's one, again, I think it's existent and it's non-existent at the same time. It's really how we, what we do and how we decide to um, really make a change in this industry that's going to, I, I guess, disrupt that that driver shortage. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it sounds like, it's like, well, driver shortage is a big problem. In fact, and I'm trying to think of the statistics, I think it was like 175,000 uh, deficit of drivers by 2024. I believe that was the last statistic. So if we have 3.2 million drivers and you're talking about 175,000 miles, <laughs> big number. Um, again, it has to do with some of those variables we just discussed, right? Like maybe it's just, it's this, this age, like this age of time where people are really interested in actually building their own businesses and staying from home, working remote. Like they don't want to get mm -hmm. in a truck. They don't want to be exposed to COVID. They don't want to be driving around yeah. for, they can get into an accident or hurt somebody else. Like maybe it's like, hey, I, if I can work from home, right? Money, then what, who cares, right? Like this right. is what people want to do now. That's why you see more people in a recruiting perspective, more than ever, want to be in a technical job. They want to be yeah. a software engineer. They want to be a designer. They want to be an entrepreneur. Why? Because you can work from home. Because mm -hmm. you don't have to go out and customer interact. You don't have to be right. face to face. Yep. So maybe that's what's happening. Like there's a lot of things that are happening in this world, but I know that what we can do is we need to stand together as an industry. This is a massive industry. And this industry, just because it's massive, the circles run very, very, very small. That's I, right. Yeah. I know it's a little industry. People, I know a lot of people that know a lot of people. And you could say something to them and all of a sudden it gets back to them. So they're like, okay, well, Maybe that's like their brother or their cousin or something. Someone mm -hmm. keep my mouth shut in this industry. But what I do know is that this industry also cares for each other, right? Yeah. So let's just do a better job at caring for the most valuable asset is what we talk yeah. about for the driver. Yeah, I think it's great. I, you know, I saw something the other day. It, it said, you know, if if there's a continuous, you know, um, decrease in drivers or any other role for that matter, like typically, you know, you have to ask the question like, um, does the job suck for one? And then um, if if that's the case, why, right? Um, is it because, just because the job sucks or is it because the environment is poor or um, people are being treated poorly? And I think there's a variety of factors that you can look at there. And yeah, there's probably, I mean, you can look at any role and there's a portion of um, any job that probably sucks, but um you know, within that, I think that's where I, I would just challenge every organization to really self-reflect and say, hey, what can we do, right, to treat people like humans, to make this uh, not just enjoyable, but a valued role and to make people feel valued. And if you can do that, that's where I think we go back to that idea of saying, like, if you focus on people first um, and and help them cover their bases right their human dignity and needs right um well you know i think if you start there then you're going to start retaining more people because you're going to help them get to where they want to go in life um and not just where you want to go at the same time so cool well um i want to be respectful of your time here anthony so i kind of want to work towards um you know wrapping up here um love your insight uh, on everything I wanted to ask a couple of questions as we kind of, um, you know, close up here, you know, and one of my favorites is, you know, if you were talking to your 20 year old self, you know, uh, about, you know, career and life, um, what would you tell your 20 year old self? If you could talk to yourself today, like what advice would you give yourself? I'm trying to remember what I was doing at 20. <laughs> uh, I think I was in college still. Yeah. Um, 
you know, definitely, if I could look back at 20 years old, um, I would definitely say, like, you know, just cut it out. <laughs> cut it out, like, you know, not knowing that. exactly what you want to do in your life. Because I think the times have definitely changed. I think there's 20-year-olds now that know exactly what they want to do. Mm-hmm. But, but the universities play a good role on that, too, and I don't have to go down that road. But universities mm-hmm. have now become just more um, – consistent, more precise with what college students want to do. So like there used to be like, I took entrepreneurship in college. Mm-hmm. That was like 10, 10, 12 years ago. Right. And it was just entrepreneurship 101. And it didn't really get any further. Than that. that was business 101 of business management. And that was business education. That was about it. Like business finance. It was just so, so broad. Right. Like today mm-hmm. I know that my younger cousin can literally study business management business management is now like entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship now is like literally at the end of the the semester it's like you're saying like working on a project and pitching that in front of investors yeah like i I never had that so at 20 Mm -hmm. years old i was probably walking around with like like a chicken with his head cut off like i don't know what (laughs) i want to do in my life you know i was like working for my cousin during the summers i was like working in, in restaurants. Like I did everything just like I'm sure you did or yeah, uh, yeah. our age, right? Like just do something. Uh, but I really didn't have a, I didn't really have a vision. I didn't have a goal. So I would say if I was 20 years old, one, yes, cut it out. Two, figure out what you want to do with your life. Maybe like create a plan, right? Like in the next three to five years, what does that look like? So mm-hmm. for any 20 year olds that might be watching this or um, I would just definitely say, yeah, like plan something out, like figure out what exactly, and you don't have to do exactly what you you're going to do for the rest of your life you might begin something and then it completely changes like me recruiting and then mm-hmm. i'm a founder of a, a truck parking company that yeah i didn't really know much about i, I knew my, my mm-hmm. uncle was a truck driver but besides yeah. that i didn't really understand the industry i learned this industry i grew in this industry yeah i became a better person in this industry so that's mm-hmm. what i've been talking to anyone so but i love that i mean one i think when i was 20 i probably was trying to figure out how you know, my bank was being overdrawn so often. I was like, that's me doing that? Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but then beyond that, I, I agree. Like, I think sometimes, you know, when you're young, you just like, you're so, you, you think you think you have to have it figured out at 20 or you don't even know what you're doing. And I like, you, I think just taking next steps, uh, if you try something, that will help you learn. And you might learn quickly, like, don't want to do that. I'm going to take another step over here. Don't want to do that. I'm going to try another step over here. And 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 creating a plan and and just taking action is so helpful because you'll you'll iterate and you'll learn, and eventually those doors are going to open up um, if you're if you're willing to keep going through them. So uh, I love that advice. It's good. Um, books. Um, you know, I'm a big reader. I think a lot of our listeners are as well. Is there a book or two that you've read in the last year or two that's been impactful that you'd share? Yeah, so I, I've been reading a lot of books, but I would say my favorite book, I really do like, there's a book called uh, Psychology of Money. And okay. right now, it's this author is not coming to my mind, but mm-hmm. that is... I'll put a, it in the show pretty, notes. I'm sorry, what? I can put it in the show notes later, so... Yeah, that'd be great. So, can't remember, again, the, the author's name, but it is probably about this big, maybe about 180 pages at most. But it is fantastic, right? Mm. So it like teaches you all about all these companies from like greed to wealth, right? And there's a difference mm. between greed and wealth. There's a difference of being rich, and there's a difference of being wealthy, right? Mm. And there's also like the psychology around like being a good investor, being a good steward of your money, being a good person to give back, to be a donator, be a charitable giver, to to uh you know, utilize your money in such a way where you can help other people, right? And it's not just being a charitable giver. It's about like literally reinvesting capital into truck parks, for example, Mm -hmm. so that we can create better experience for drivers. So I really just, I love that book. That was something that stood out when you asked that question. So I would recommend it to everybody. Please, yes, put that into the, um, into the, the podcast later i want everybody to if they can go ahead and, and, and download it either on the, the ebook mm-hmm. or definitely buy in hardcover i bought in hardcover because personally i just love the tangibility yeah, yeah. so i would say that's personally mine other than that i'm a big person who who just loves to read articles i read articles all yeah, day. yeah. 
It's like my, my wife would be like, wow, you're wealth of knowledge. Like, how do you know so much about this random industry? Because <laughs> I just love it. I just love to read articles, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I would say the art of money would definitely be my answer. Sure. Cool, cool. I'll definitely pick that up. Uh, anything financial always, um, you know, um, uh, perks me up, makes me interested. So that's that's awesome. I'll pick that up. Well, thank you, Anthony, for being on. I appreciate it. Uh, loved your insight on um, just the industry, on truck park, on recruiting. Uh, I think it's super helpful for for everyone listening. If people want to get in touch with you, um, be it um, you know interest in truck park. Um, or just to connect with you um, to to learn more about what you have going on, how should they get a hold of you? If you're interested in Truck Park, the easiest way is just to go to the website, www.truckpark.com. You can also download our free truck parking app on the Google Play and the Apple iOS stores. It's free to download, create a profile, then you're able to raw plan your trip more efficiently. If you want to get a hold of me, you can just simply go to my LinkedIn profile. You can follow me. You can connect with me directly and send me a message. I'm, I'm on it almost every day, and I'd love to uh, connect with everybody here. Cool. Awesome. Anthony, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Recruiting Stories podcast. If you haven't yet, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Check us out on LinkedIn, Adrian Chapman, and Cover 3 Consulting is our company page. Also check out our website, www.cov3consulting.com. Again, thanks for joining us. And we just simply want to remind you that you can change the world by putting people in a position where they can do the most good. And you do that by recruiting. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.